All right, good evening, everyone. We uh, are pleased to have you here tonight to talk about the, uh, the town hall working group's work over the past several months. Um, I'm going to actually ask. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, over here? Yes, because yeah. he's going to drive the. Oh, there we go. Great, thank you. There you go, thanks. And um, so I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. It's I know it's uh, it's another night out for everybody. So, um, but hopefully, hopefully, folks are watching this at home tonight, and it gives them an opportunity to kind of um, understand the work that we've done. The presentation that we're offering tonight was one that was actually offered um, back about uh, about two weeks ago to the to the uh, Adcom, the advisory committee, and. Um, so we wanted to try and offer this, you know, for the online, uh, for the on-air viewing audience, as well as folks that want, had any particular question that they'd like to ask tonight. So what I'd like to do is go through the presentation, and then uh, if anybody has any questions after the presentation's over, we'll be happy to, uh, happy to go through those, okay? First, I'd like to offer is a, brief, a brief history of, of what has happened over the past uh, several months. The working group was formed in May of 2014 to begin the, addressing the longstanding uh, dispute and issues over how the aging and deterioration of town hall buildings should be addressed. The group was formed by the town manager, myself, um, uh, looking to try and primarily learn the, the history of the issue and to understand all the different concerns and issues that have been raised over that course of, course of several years. In fact, uh, I'm told that this issue has gone back as many as 10 to 15 years in terms of how this debate has gone on. The group consists of town officials and interested citizens and have, who have varying opinions about how the, how the town hall should be addressed. And I think it's important to note that it was a pretty diverse group and uh, we had uh, folks from virtually all walks of life who, who wanted to participate in this process. Um, I didn't actually limit it to anyone who, didn't, who, who, um, who, who actually expressed interest in serving. Anybody who wanted to come could certainly uh, participate and anybody who had questions could certainly uh, ask those questions. The group has uh, met over 13 times uh, during the course of the last six months, and uh, meetings were held every every Tuesday afternoon at the Boyden, every other Tuesday at the Boyden Library, uh, roughly around 4.30 to 6.30 every night. Uh, and um, again, 13 times uh, over the course of about a six-month period. The topics discussed have included renovation of the existing building, site options for new construction, new construction on the existing site, or new construction on the existing lot. And what I mean by that is that the existing new construction on the existing site would mean that actually taking the building down and replacing it exactly in the same exact location, or taking a new construction on the existing lot, which, in, which includes the parking lot. The group has analyzed the program space needs for all of the existing offices and the common space building requirements. Uh, what we did as a benchmark to initiate initial for initially was to look at the KBA study that was done back uh, back in two, two, 2011. Uh, just to look at it as a benchmark, and then we took that information and said, okay, if we were to start from scratch, how would we analyze this work? And so we, we took that information, we started looking at all the um, individual spaces, talked to, to folks that work in those spaces, and then we came up with our own plan of space requirements based on that analysis. And then the financing options were then dis were looked at. Um, there was a subcommittee that was uh, looking at just the financing options. Um, included the director of finance, myself, and another member of the committee. Um, we, uh, we were certainly able to get into that discussion, but suffice it to say that we do have a financing plan that will address this plan uh, going forward. Our goal, my, our primary goal, is to, is to pay for this uh, within the existing levy capacity of the town so we don't look towards a, a, a two and a half um, override or a debt exclusion to pay for this project. The public outreach and education uh, has been underway for several weeks, and the group has developed a substantial list of frequently asked questions. Uh, that information has been placed on the town's website and, uh, and in the new local newspaper. Uh, the Foxborough Reporter, who, by the way, I appreciate all the, uh, the efforts they have put into putting as much information out for folks on, on what we've done over the past several months. Based on all the information gathered to date, it is the consensus opinion of the group, that minus one member, that the town should construct a new town hall building in the parking lot of the existing location, which is that of 40 South Street. The group would also like to leave the town hall staff, uh, let the town hall staff remain at the existing location and work in the existing building until the, lo the new building is constructed, and then uh, which, will, which will create some temporary parking challenges, we understand that. 
and we've also addressed that with the architects and the, uh, and, the, and the overall project managers, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it will also limit the number of costly relocations to just one uh, if we were able to do it that way. An RFP was prepared by the members of the group to identify the soft costs of this project, in which the soft costs in this case are the design costs and the costs for, um, for managing the project itself. Um, the soft costs were determined through the, through the RFP request for proposal process that was used to identify the architectural firm and the overall project manager of choice who will then design and manage the new town hall project. And then the RFP process identified six candidates for the architect services and an additional 11 candidates for the OPM services, the OPM being the overall project manager. A subcommittee of the working group along with members of the town's permanent building committee was, has identified LLB as the architect and Vertex as the overall project manager of choice for this project. LLB, many folks will recall, was the actual designer of the, of the library project, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which was a very successful project in the community. Um, I will note, and it's a very important note, that the design of, of the town hall is, is highly emphasized to be that of a, of a colonial design. And that will not be a glass type structure, which was, which was obviously the case in the, in the library project. So we are very much, we very much understand that the need for having a colonial design for the town hall, and we very much support that. Vertex uh, was the over, is the overall project management, but the reason, uh, one of the reasons why they were selected was that they just recently finished an, a new town hall project up in Drake, uh, and did a very good job of keeping the project on 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 time and in budget within budget. So we're very uh, pleased to have two very very highly qualified um, um, individuals or companies rather working with the town to, uh, to, addre to address this project. We have not obviously awarded any contracts at this point because we, we still need to, to have the funding question uh, asked and, uh, and supported at town meeting, which is coming up on November 17th. And that's the purpose, of course, of tonight's meeting, is to, to let folks know that that, uh, that, that, pro that project is coming up for consideration. The total combined soft cost funding request for the advisory committee uh, to, that was submitted to the advisory committee last night um, and to the special town meeting on November 17th has been identified to be 557535 It's important to note that early on in the process, we had estimated that cost to be around $550,000, and as such, we were very close to that estimate, coming in just 70, around $7,500 over that, that estimate. So we were very, very pleased that the numbers came in. I want to thank uh, Bill Euchner, who was uh, very successful in negotiating the terms of those, of those agreements. If the town meeting approves the soft cost funding request, the, the project will be turned over to the public building committee to hire the architect and the project manager. The architect will be asked to produce a set of overall plans, including design plans, working drawings, and cost estimates for a new building. They, along with the OPM, will then be asked to address a number of logistical issues, including a schedule for the project financing, bidding, and entire construction uh, in FF and E phases, which is the fitting uh, fixtures, uh, Fixtures, fi furniture, fixtures, fu furniture and, 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 and equipment, thank you, uh, phase, the construction, timing, and expected completion dates, along with the details associated with moving out of and the demolition of the existing structure. Also included in that is, is, a, is a parking plan, parking dy dynamics of how that will work if we're, during the construction phase as we stay in that building. And then preliminary, preliminary indications are that if the architects are able to complete their work in, in a six to eight month time frame for designing the building itself, and they are able to identify the real time cost of this project, the town will then request another special town meeting to fund the construction phase of the project in September or October of 2015, roughly a year from, a year from now. If construction is able to begin in October, November of 2015, the new building should be completed by the following October, November 16 of 16, or in early 2017. So we're, we're very optimistic that if, if anything, everything goes as planned, I think what's important to note here is that this is a, this is a different approach than what we've used in the past, where we've actually, in the, as I'm, I'm told, because obviously I wasn't here, that the projects have always come up with one number that was funded. This is actually a two-phase uh, funding program in which we're asking for funding for the, for the design piece in which we, we know what that number is before we actually vote on it. And then also we'll know what the, the actual construction number is uh, and the FF&E piece of that uh, that will go to town meeting um, in October of 2015 if, uh, if in fact we're, we're able to do that. 
The group, uh, the, the real question, the, the, the important question that, that emerged during this entire discussion was why new versus renovation? And I think it's important to note that the group was, is comprised of, of, the working group is comprised of members with backgrounds from all areas of, of the building trades, including engineers, architects, planners, contractors, and estimators. Following a review of all the factors that would need, would need to be addressed through the renovation of the existing structure, the group concluded that constructing a new building was the best investment for taxpayers' dollars. And, uh, and I'll get into that more in a second. The, given the limitation of the existing building, the group did not believe that the structure could accommodate all of the modern amenities and current code, code requirements without negatively impacting the identified program and space needs of the project. What we mean by that is that we, we think that with all the different new requirements that are required of new construction in the public sector, uh, i.e. Uh, uh, seismic uh, shoring, et cetera, in, in the ADA requirements, uh, that we did not believe that the existing uh, structure would be able to accommodate that without compromising some of the space requirements that we were looking to, to try to, to accommodate. The working group and the, and the town manager all agree that if this project is approved by the town, it must have an ongoing maintenance plan associated with it. Uh, one of the, the, the major criticisms, and, and, and rightfully so, and, and we understand that, is that uh, this was about a 50-year-old building, and that as such we're here re looking to replace it. Uh, we all agree that, that that's not something we should be looking to do in the, going on to the, into the future. The town and the school departments have already established an informal working arrangement with the town where certain repairs and maintenance projects are handled through the existing staff of the school department. A more formalized plan that will address cleaning, custodial, repairs, and maintenance of town and school facilities will be addressed in the town manager's fiscal 2016 budget. And it's important to note, too, that, that both the school committee and the, and the, and the uh, board of selectmen are looking to have a joint meeting on this very topic coming up in the next few weeks. So we want to try and formalize that plan a little bit more and get all the issues out on the table as, as, as quickly as we can. And then finally, just as a summary of everything that I've presented here tonight, the working group was established to evaluate all the options for addressing the conditions at Town Hall. The group has concluded that, that a building on, on building a new, new building at Town Hall uh, for a Town Hall is in the parking lot of the 40 South Street location is the best option. The group prepared an RFP for selecting and determining the cost of an architect and an OPM and the OPM. The group has identified LLB architects as the finalists for the design of the project and they have identified Vertex as the finals for the overall project manager. On Wednesday of, of, of meeting tonight, the, the, the amount recommended to fund the total soft cost, I, I apologize for Wednesday was last night, that the amount recommended to fund the total cost, soft cost of these two services was 557535 which was recommended, by the way, by the, way by, these, by the advisory committee last night by a vote of 9 to 1. So we were very appreciative of their work and, um, and also I, I just want to take this opportunity to thank all the members of the working group who have done, I think, a terrific job of identifying all the issues. Uh, we didn't always agree, and that was the whole purpose of that, that process, was to come up with a, with a diverse set of opinions that ultimately would lead to a, what we think is, is a good solution. Um, and then ultimately, I, I know there was quite a bit of discussion about this, about the renovation versus the new. There were a lot of great points raised about the renovation issue, and some of it were, were compelling. But the more compelling arguments were to build a new building because we felt that the, that the taxpayers' dollars that were going to be spent uh, of, of a significant nature to build a new structure for the most part would be better spent in building in a new, for a new building altogether. So uh, that is the recommendation that we've reached, um, and that is the recommendation that we're here presenting to you tonight. And uh, anyone who has any questions, uh, there are many members of the, of, the, uh, of the working group that are here tonight. If you could all raise your hands, please, and, and then and just identify yourselves. Uh, John, you want to start over there? Uh, John Rhodes. Uh, I'm a retired civil engineer, and I also sit on the uh, planning board. All right. Jack? Uh, yes, Jack Schlayer, <laughs> architect, retired now. Uh, I've been working as an architect for 40 years, and I am now retired. Okay. Thank you. Bill? Bill you the chairman of the building committee, town of Foxville. David? Uh, David Feldman, um, I'm vice president of real estate, uh, presently doing ground up development in <laughs> housing. Um, presently have two projects in permitting. Uh, each project is about 80,000 square feet. Roger Hill, DPW director of Foxborough. I have 55 years experience as an engineer and a surveyor. Thank you. 
Randy. Randy Scollins, Finance Director, Town of Foxborough, and I feel like I got my engineering to read uh, serving on this committee. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Dick? Dick Heidecker, uh, retired architect. Thank you. Anybody else? That's it. Okay. I think that was it. So um, that's the presentation for tonight. We certainly uh, welcome any questions that anyone may have. I know that there's not a big crowd here tonight, but uh, any so questions? What, what do you think we'll start to see uh, renderings of what the building might look like? Uh, I'm going to defer the bill on that because yeah, I think in terms the, of process. Uh, one, <clears throat> of the, one of the, when we did our uh, reviews of the four architects, um, three of the architects actually worked with the newer models uh, called BIM modeling, which basically is a three-dimensional architectural series. Um, and quite honestly, because of the way this project is being presented to the town and that the end result, people have to be able to really look at and, and feel comfortable with everything laying out properly. Uh, we felt that that was an important piece of, of why we were going to select which architect we selected. So in their design phase, as they're designing the building itself, not so much in the original schematic design, the, the very first few weeks that they're working on this, but into the design phase itself, we will start to get a feel for how this the building is going to start to lay out from a structure point of view. Is it going to be you know, just two floors stacked on each other? Uh, but by the time they complete that, they can actually put different faces on the building. And, and you know what we have basically charged them with is to listen to the community and look around the community and, and look at what we consider to be colonial because a lot of people have different views on what colonial is. Uh, someone might look at you know Foxborough Savings and say that's colonial, but really I would say that's not something more like Foxborough um, uh, Rockland is more like a federal or a even Foxborough Federal is more a, a, a colonial look. So I think you really need to get the view of the, the citizens. They understand that. They're going to be looking okay. around at it, okay. and that's what they're going to model on top of this. And we'll be able to actually get 3D okay. uh, designs and looks at it. So. <coughs> right. Anybody else? Any questions? Jim? Okay. Just say, um, there's two, two numbers that have been kicked around now. One's architectural and all the subs underneath it as soft cost. And the other one is the OPM. Um, it's a relatively new term, OPM. Uh, so a lot of people are familiar with the clerk of the works, but can you explain what an OPM does and some of the checks and balances? Let me just uh, repeat the question for the, for, the, for the listening audience. Is that The question is, uh, can you explain what, what an OPM actually is? Because that's a relatively new term in, in, the, in the construction industry, um, it's particularly in, in public sector construction. And that um, and there's also the cost associated with the with the designer costs and, and some of the subs. And maybe you can explain a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, and you're 100% right when you made the comment about the clerk of the works. When we built the, the Ahern, to give you an example, at that point, uh, having an owner's project manager was not a requirement. Um, you know, having a clerk of the works, which basically was our agent, the town's agent, on site all day long when construction was going on, that could document any of the changes, any of the issues that happened. Uh, they're not there to tell the, the general contractor what to do. They're not there to tell what the architect what to do. They're, they're to report back to the owners and explain what is going on and if they see an issue to alert us to that issue so that we could coordinate it because they don't have that say. We as the, the community have the say on who controls the, the designer and, um, and how we get these changes fixed. So they really are your eyes and ears on the site all day long. Um, what's made it more expensive over time because of the way this law was instituted is where we would have a single person on site um, that we would pay a salary to ourselves uh, to manage the project now under the way the state guidelines are set up, it basically, um, these companies have kind of morphed into where there are uh, two to three levels on the OPM side of it. One is that day-to-day -day person on site. Uh, one is a, a, a project manager that sits above that person who attends all the meetings, basically has a little bit higher skill set. Um, some of them will have engineering skill sets or architectural skill sets. And then they even have a third level on top of that, usually, which is one of the, the principals within the company, again, who will be involved in a lot of our meetings. Um, in the, the beginning stage of the thing, they, they're <coughs> technically supposed to be on from day one of, of the project. So they'll come on and all the way through schematic design, regular design, the top level of their staff, uh, who is more versed in the um, value engineering with the project, they're more versed with layouts and, and design, will be involved more with us than, as, a, as an example, the clerk of the work side of it. They don't actually show up, obviously, until we actually go to construction and then they're on the site uh, from that point forward. So. It's a more robust version of the old clerk of the works concept, but it is the owner's representative on site, effectively daily, because none of us will be there. Uh, um, you know, every time the architect is there, if the architect goes into seven days a week, 
they have to be there seven days a week. If they're there, you know, nights, they have to be there nights. When we did the uh, the high school, as an example, we had uh, an OPM as well. Um, we ran second shifts because obviously we couldn't do most of our work during the day when, when the school was open. Um, and the owner's representative was there uh, monitoring, taking pictures, you know, confirming what was being done from what was on the plans to be done. Uh, they're supposed to be well versed on what the actual design is so that they can see something that, if it's going wrong during the projects. So. Could you give a general breakdown of 8557 and the other three numbers? Sure. Repeat that for the audience, Bill. Yes, um, the, 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 there was a request to break down what the 557 number means. The 557535 is the, is the amount that we're requesting for from town meeting for the soft cost funding. And it's actually broken into two categories. One is, one is for the, uh, pump, the, the majority of the funds, I believe $507,000 is for, is for the, um, is for the design phase, yeah. and then and that the uh, OPM cost is about forty nine thousand dollars. Exactly. And um, and I believe that uh, and th and that's because during the phases of these this uh, there were two phases. One is the construction phase, and one of the other ones design phase. The design phase obviously you'd have more design money in that in that piece of it, in the, as opposed to the second piece, which is very little. But in the, and then the OPM side would be much more expensive in the second phase than the, than the initial phase. Right, and, and the reason for the, you know, the exact numbers were 507, 675 is the designer's uh, upfront cost, 49,860 uh, is the, the owner's project manager's cost uh, in the first phase. And as I said, because in, for the OPM, the only thing that they're really putting up in the first phase is their upper level management for site meetings or, you know, for regular design meetings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. Is that is that based on a projected cost? Is that a percentage, or did they put down fifty thousand for this, uh, twenty five thousand for this, two hundred thousand for this? In, in other words, uh, breaking it down, is it what is it based on? Okay, it's the. The, the, the basic point is the, the working committee developed a budget um, that you know we have been putting out there, which is $7.2 million in total. The $7.2 million is an all-inclusive number. It's meant to uh, be basically uh, turnkey once you're moving in, okay, which means furniture, everything is, is in the place. The, when you're dealing with the architectural fees, you're obviously not paying uh, based on the $7.2 million because their number is also in that $7.2 million. So what you have to do is back that down to a number um, of what you believe the construction cost will, will be in a range of. Um, and in this case, what we've done is backed it down to about $6 million as the construction phase part of that. They do their basic services. Under their basic services, you have structural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, fire alarm, and specifications. Um, that's 545,000 of their total budget, okay? Their, their added services, uh, the technology and security we are gonna do in town because we have our own staff that can do that. They will coordinate that with the architects, so we're not paying for that side of it. Uh, civil engineering, landscape, survey borings, uh, furnishing, architectural, hazardous materials, uh, cost estimates, miscellaneous printing, uh, and distribution um, is the additional cost and additional services that they provide under their contract. So you're saying that 9% of 600,000 is 540,000 uh, roughly. It, it, roughly 9% is going to the architect Correct. for architectural services. services. Now, what if, God forbid, that the budget comes in over that 6,000? It's 545,000 period. Uh, is that number fixed? What if the number comes in at $8.3 million for the thing? It's about 45000 it's, it's a fixed number for it's this the project. same thing we've done in the last few projects where we try to fix it right up front. So you have to be a little bit, when you're de negotiating this out, in other words, the architect doesn't have a, um, <coughs> an, an inflation, not an inflation, but a uh, plus or minus an open, factor. An open check. Right. No. Right. They have uh, a fixed number. What about change orders and all that? Is change orders, they, they, the. You've got to eat it? Yeah, because a change order really, unless it's, it's if we create some major no, no, change. No, that's, yeah, that's different. That's, that's a change order. But if it's a, 
A uh, change order that is basically based on design or issues that way, there, there's no additional. Uh, <coughs> For an office building that we're, we're going to build, is 9% roughly in the ballpark? From everything I've seen, normal architectural fees can go anywhere from 8 to 10% in this range. We've paid, um, this 9% is very similar to what we paid on the library project. You see, I've run as high How as 11%. How did you deal with the negotiations with it? How much did you bring in that? Um, the total okay. between the OPM and the architect was uh, about $80,000. Well, a bit better. Yeah. Yeah. I can get a hamburger off that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So far, I haven't seen anything, any cost numbers to show the benefit of this versus what I think most homeowners would say, why don't we just fix what we have? I mean, I haven't seen any comparison here. It's like everybody's just decided to make a new building, but where's the hard numbers that say, here's why we want to do it? They're always seen in the paper or here is, is rhetoric, but there's no numbers presented. And I was hoping I'd see A and B so that mm -hmm. you could tell which is which. The problem with A and B um, as you stated, and, and I truly agree with you because that's the way I would normally approach something on my own house as far as taking it apart. But in an issue like this, the problem with renovation versus new construction, what we what we have decided to do, rather than try to sell the town on a on a number um, up front, is to actually go through the entire process of developing the number on the new. Uh, construction and, and bring it forward. Now we've told the architects that we plan to build this building in that $7.2 million number. The renovation number, you can you can look at it a lot of different ways. And yes, we did have KVA do some study work on the original thing, but the problem is we never had a, a study that was a gut renovation. So we could have paid for another study to be done to do that. The second part of that, even if you did do that, the only thing that would tell you is what it would cost to bring this building wall to wall cleaned out uh, with structural, but it doesn't tell you what the condition of the walls are and what the potential problems are within those walls once you start right. to go there. And therefore, I could still not give you a firm cost until we actually started ripping those walls apart. And at that point, it's way too late. Obviously, we're, we're too far in the process. So either way, we had to go too far one way or the other mm -hmm. to be able to give you a firm number that we could totally compare one against the other. They would have both been estimates. Strictly an estimate on the new and strictly an estimate on the renovation. It just seems like we could get a little closer then. I mean, it, 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 it just well, what's seems the, what's like you could test or do something to say, hey, this is salvageable or this isn't. Mm -hmm. And I don't see where that's been done. Bill? What, what, let, let, me, let me just give one more thought on that. We actually looked at, there was, there was, we had quite a bit of discussion internally on the committee about the whole concept mm -hmm. of building new versus renovation. And we tried to go through the, the various aspects of, of why a renovation would be more would, would be more of a challenge to us than than, than building new. The, the reason why, is, as Bill pointed out, we could not actually give a, a firm number on the renovation because we didn't know what was behind the walls. And and in order to do that, in order to truly know that number, you have to do what is known as destructive testing. So in other words, you have to actually take the walls apart, all right, to do that and and, and make that determination. Then the question is, what are we really going to gain by doing that? And the question, and, and that was the thing we kept coming back to. Okay, even if even if it is cheaper, so-called cheaper, to to take the to to stay in the existing building, we don't know what that number is. And we've heard numbers thrown out. I mean, no, I mean, Dick has, has used several numbers to, to try and come to that conclusion, but he doesn't know that number for sure, for certain. It's only an estimate, because the the end of the end of the day, and from my experience. In many cases, renovations can be more expensive than building new. And, so, and, I, and I think that's, that's, that was the fear that we had, is that we end up with a situation where we start the process and then we have, oh my gosh, we have this other expense we didn't know about. And that was the biggest, biggest concern that we had. And I, I think that was universally the position that everybody shared when we talked about this. Except, you know, obviously Dick had a different opinion of that. So. Well, I don't know if it's that different. I think the, the, there's several questions that have been, been posed. Um, primarily, what has been exposed to date has been a, a, a litany of problems with the existing building. We've heard them. We've seen them written both by proponents and uh, antagonists. Uh, we've gone through a lot of discussion in and out on many of these items. I think the biggest problem is 
the tonality of some of the issues that have been expressed. It reached a point in, uh, on October 7th, the meeting that we had, one member got up and walked out. Um, there was some yelling and some unfavorable comments back and forth uh, considering renovation versus new. I think what we need to do is somehow to get a, a different kind of tone on the whole issue so that we understand fully what can be done, what can't be done, and what is the best approach that, that we, we can take. Let, let me give you just a couple of examples. Uh, you know, Bill wrote, wrote a, uh, a column. I'm not opposed to his comments. I think most of them were, were uh, effective and most of them um, could be constrained uh, as truisms. However, it's the tonality of the issue which I, I think is the real problem. An example, the existing building is old. Well, we rebuilt the Igo building. The Hearn School was older than Town Hall. Burl and Taylor are the same age as Town Hall. Do we tear them down? Uh, of course not. Uh, they, they've had better maintenance. Um, but the, the question is, in essence, you need to look at each building in terms of what is there today and what we can look ahead to see. Um, They've mentioned the gut rehabilitation, but they're two different types. If we're dealing with this old house, they open a wall and they find there's a column there that was never on the drawings because someone put a, a load uh, upstairs or made a change. You've got to go in and pull the column out, put steel across, and put new structural systems in there. For a pure gut on a commercial building, this is the cleanest approach to a renovation option that you have. If you're talking about alteration, this is when you go in and you want to move a door or move the partition over or cut something down. That will cost money and it will cost big bucks. But when you go in and you do the full renovation, the gut renovation, you're cleaning everything out. And in cleaning everything out, all of the dollar signs that are normally on an alteration kind of project disappear. Because that heating system is gone, the piping is gone, the electrical is gone, and you're bringing in totally new equipment throughout a gut renovation as you would once the shell is up on new construction. It's the same work. And basically, if you looked at the estimates, it's the same estimate for the new work between the, the, the two. So the question it isn't really the alteration in this whole house concept. I understand what, what they, they've said, but the problem is <coughs> there are a couple of little issues that keep jumping up. <laughs> we all remember the, the, the kayak episode. Bill Casbarro with his kayak. Yeah. Water came in the two entrance doors downstairs. It did not come through the foundation wall. It did not come up through the, the foundation slab. It came in the two entrance doors. It was invited in. The water that got into the garage, there's a six inch gasoline curb which kept the water from the garage getting into the, the basement area itself. A backhoe that we own and an employee that we pay could have dug two ditches four years ago and we wouldn't have this damn water problem in the basement. But that's neither here nor there. I've talked about it for four years and nothing ha has been done. Lead contamination. The toxic material in that building we own, whether we renovate the building or build it new, we cannot mix toxic materials with building construction debris in a dump. Regardless of which approach we have, the lead and the asbestos will be taken care of separately by separate contractors licensed to do that kind of work. Then you have the choice. You renovate or you build new. But you're going to have to pay for the toxic waste removal, the lead and everything else. You know, the histori history on the lead, uh, the lead you know, I hate to bring it up, this is a, almost a 15-year battle. The state told us to get the lead out. We did a study, we went through, we took some lead out, but we only appropriated $30,000. It was worth seventy. The state somehow had their arm twisted, well, we're not going to get the other forty. give us a break, we're going to do some work on the building, 
and nothing has been done since. Uh, this is the maintenance issue again, which I'm sure given the statements that have been made, we're, we're going to take care of. Uh, Bill mentioned one of them, I forget which one, the water damage in the brick walls. Jack has been on top of that ever since he, he joined the, the group. Uh, even before he joined the group on the ad hoc. Uh, the masonry walls are a problem. We aren't sure what to do with them. But we brought in an engineer who said the building is substantially sound. It's not going to collapse because of the masonry walls. All they need is a little repointing. I can disagree with that, so can Jack. I think, yeah, I think, but, I think that's, that's, that, that's not actually what he said, but uh, Dick. I think, he said let, he let me just correct continue. that point because it's important that everybody hear this. We at, the question was asked, can the building withstand for the next three, three years? Three years, yeah. Not, not for a lifetime, three for years. the next three years. Three years, three years. Yeah. Three years. I have no problem with okay. that, but I, I'm just saying when we talk about this, at, the, at this stage, um, we need to do some work on that masonry wall, and this could tip it between the renovation and the new, just for the logic of how long will we have to wait to get that answer, and what might that answer be, and what cost is attached to it. You know, the, the other things on um, seismic and ADA, and the code issues of the elevator, and what, new and renovated, it's the same in position. It's not different. It's not only the renovation that faces that issue, both new and the renovation have to meet that criteria of code in the very same manner. Not exactly the same system, but the same manner must be done. The, the last point on, on this, uh, the ener energy efficiency, yes. But the same thing, the code requires X number of, of an R value between a wall, a ceiling, a door, you name it. They're the same for both conditions. So to, to highlight all of the quote problems, all of the things that have to be done, they have to be done for both. There's one condition that isn't and that's the masonry that we've been talking about. Will this tip it? It could tip it. Uh, the last comment I, I make is, is, is sort of chuckling at the whole thing. Um, Bill's final comment. During the tour phase of the selection process, virtually every architect commented they were glad to see it was a new construction project. The RFP that they read was very clear. New construction, town hall, and demolition. You think an architect's gonna come in, talk to anyone at town hall, and say I favor a renovation? You're out of your mind. You know, the, you know the, there are whole kinds of issues. There are two other side issues on this. The architects come in. They know what the fee is for a new building and what the estimate is for the new building. And they're going to make more money on that than they're going to make on the renovation, which is a cheaper construction, but a higher fee. You know, you, you can argue this back and forth. Yeah. Architects are weird people. Jack and I know it personally. Our wives know it uh, very well as, as well. But mm -hmm. the point is, uh, we are interested in building my building. Mm -hmm. We're not interested in renovating your old building. So the architects have their own little egos to play with, and we have to recognize this as, as we go through the process. So that, that, that whole thing, yeah. to me, if we could change the tone on this whole issue, I think we could solve a lot of problems and get this thing moving. The last point I'd like to make uh, in general would be, I think what we need to do if we go new is not marry ourselves to build in the parking lot only. I think it behooves us to say, look, this is the site, there is an existing building, we might be able to live there for two years. But what is the best interest and the best plan that can go on that site? We should not marry ourselves to staying in that building. Because if you look at the cost of what we need to do for repairs, what the, the pipe in, the, in South Street I talked to Roger about, uh, uh, the, the paving, the sidewalk, the new walk, the ramp that we'll have to put in, uh, the blasting that goes on, you know, relocation is carried in the budget at $240,000. We were told $400,000. Um, hmm. But all of this repair work and blasting and what have you is a $250,000 ticket, whether we like it or not. And we have to demo that once we're, we're done. 
those new sidewalks and things. So think about this as part of the overall process. I just wanted to make, the, make those points. Okay. We need a tone change in what we're saying. The building can be renovated. The new building can be better because, but for four weeks I've had that question on the street and in the newspaper. What can you tell me that the new building will give us that the renovated does not? I have had not had one single call on that question except from the discussion group on, the, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the question is at this point, renovate or new? New is on the table, we're going to have to make the decision on new. But let's make it on the best possible direction we can. We own that site, we own that building. If it's better to tear it down, let's tear it down now and put the new building where the old one was. Let's make that kind of decision in the best interests of the town. I thank you. How do we do that, though? Yeah. How do we do what? Uh, you, you, you would then have to have a bid price on a new and, and a bid price no. on... on yeah, you, sure. that, you, sure. right now you you Monson. direct you direct the architect and well, the let me let me let me hold on because I, I get this Mr. gentleman. Egan, yeah, I, yes, and I, I yes, don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, you, you talked mm -hmm. about tone, and one or two slides down here, I, I see a very positive tone. What is I'm basing mm -hmm. this comment on my trust of a room full of diverse subject matter experts. Okay. But one of the things I really appreciate seeing as a member of this town is finally a strategy to go forward with and without dissension and with and without, uh, as we call it in my 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 my, my business, uh, armchair engineering. Mm -hmm. But there's a really interesting point in the slide where the schools and the town are going to, if you will, have a Venn diagram of sharing maintenance costs. And kids listening at home, look up what a Venn diagram is, okay? And I, I think it's interesting that we're moving forward with sharing maintenance costs, whatever those may be, as the two part stakeholding parties go forward, showing that one of the lessons learned in this town is that we are going to maintain as well as the schools have in the past and put in the rear view mirror the problems that we've had in in the past with other municipal buildings, but with a, with a group of people that are really invested in doing the right thing for this town with other silos of, of budgets that equal the towns, the school committee, frankly. We have a $30 million budget, the town has a super high budget as well, but we're, we're working together because it's all one cluster of municipal buildings that we all have to pay into. And so I think to your point, Dick, with the tone, we're already starting to see at least a rumbling or a trembling of cooperative professionalism, administration, and political will, if you will, mm -hmm. in moving forward with this. And, and I'm sorry uh, if I took up too much time, but thank you, Mr. Keegan. No, for thank, you, me thank you for the comment. Thank you for the comment. Uh, I'd like to also add something to Dick's uh, comments, and, and you know, this is the one irrefutable issue that we cannot address uh, by renovating the building. We do have to penetrate the, if we were to renovate the building, we have to penetrate the floors to put in all the structural steel that has to go in, because you have to have footings below what would go in on those, those steel structures. You're going to have to penetrate the floor um, where the elevator system is going to, to go uh, to some degree. Whether you do a hydraulic pit or an electronic pull, there's still going to be a pit to some degree there. We do have water table problems underneath that building. In new construction, the code requires that we actually have vapor barriers and, and controls from underneath the building all the way up. There is absolutely no way on God's green earth you can do that on old construction. You can't meet that need. So you cannot create that part of the energy efficiency code. You cannot create that part of the uh, you know, code that would protect the water values or the, the, the uh, impermeable values of the, the foundation and, and building itself that way. And then, so which, which is a huge problem as far as I'm concerned. The secondary problem to the, to the building, and as a taxpayer, just like the rest of you, obviously my first choice is always to renovate something and always to take care of it well enough that you mm -hmm. can renovate something. I'm not going to say the reason that we can't renovate that building is because we didn't take care of the building. It's created a lot of issues. 
The real issue, though, is that building is designed and was built very differently than a number of other buildings. This building, as an example, is a, is a rock. It is probably one of the best I've seen in the town. Um, it is structurally exceptional. So when it came time to do something here, instead of spending like Newton did 100 plus million dollars or 200 million dollars to do something, we had the bones. And we, we were able to come in here and for $90 a square foot, we renovated this building back up to what everybody else is trying to build brand new on. Mm -hmm. So our first reaction is always to try to do that because we know that's our best value as a town. When we, when we came and looked at the, the, uh, the, the original building committee, my, the, the committee that I chair, uh, the permanent missile building committee, when we looked at town hall, we all felt Number one, we wanted to renovate that building because we all like the way it looks. We all like what it is, mm -hmm. and we all felt that that would be our best value. One by one, we all came back to the conclusion after we looked at the engineering issues, after we looked at the envelope, after we looked at the problems within the building, that by the time we were done, there wasn't one person on my committee that said, let's keep that building. And the, the final thing is, in the construction of the existing town hall, the outside walls are a very different construction that, that is done currently and that was done on many of the other buildings. And that is, it's a, a, a brick exterior with a four inch block interior. And they are, and what's happened is the brick actually is, if you look at it every so many courses, the brick goes the opposite way over that four inch brick, over that four inch block. That's the entire structural part of the wall. There is nothing else mm -hmm. that's structural mm -hmm. to that wall. So if there is deterioration in that structure, in that block or in that brick, that's where the, the point that Dick was making, that's where the point could be a very big disaster for us. And I'm not willing to gamble that as, as a, a taxpayer because by the time we make that decision, we are way too far down the road. We're, we're absolutely done. We're gonna have to do it, whatever it is. So if our big value is in saving the exterior brick wall, which I don't see the big value in, we're making a big mistake if something goes wrong to us. And I can't, I can't sit and, and tell anybody in this audience or anybody at home that I can guarantee you that's not gonna be our problem. Okay, there's no way to test for that. There Without is. doing a significant there amount of yeah, you, know, you have, have to pull windows, yeah. you have to see how the lentils are, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to do a significant amount of work around the entire building to make sure, because you could have one side that's totally deteriorated and three sides that are great. And I'll tell you, we've hit projects where we said, oh, this is all going to be good because we, we tested one area. <laughs> and we came around the other and we're like, oh yeah. my God. Surprise. Perfect Bill. example, here at the, at the high school, all of the exterior still, sills on the windows are, were a, uh, like a granite sill, okay? We came out and we actually tested around the entire building. We took off, there was a, an aluminum cover on all those sills. We took, all, we took the sills off around the entire building, saw that we were in perfect shape. We were, this is great. We took off the, you know, so we stopped. Now obviously, we're not going to strip every single one in the building to do this. We come back, we start construction, we start taking those off. 60% of them were totally deteriorated and we had to replace them but not one that we picked in our entire round of the entire building. I don't know what the odds are on that. Yeah. I can tell you it's slim, <laughs> but we ended up having to come up with that money in the budget, and we were very fortunate we had the money in the budget to handle. Bill, so. there, 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 there's another side to that, which I think it works in the town's favor as well. The masonry cannot be touched at the present time. It is the structural entity of that building. We can't touch it until we get the steel inside. Once the steel's in place, then we can begin to play around with that masonry wall, testing, cutting, uh, whatever. The That's only advantage that is that the cost of replacing that masonry as it is, is less than building a new masonry wall. Given the KBA uh, numbers that have been uh, debated for some time. I'm not they, so sure of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I I, there's, there's, there's debate over that, that point. As yeah. I said, yeah. given the KBA yeah. numbers. Yeah. But that is the issue. You've right. got to get yeah. the steel in before you can touch that. Well, it's, there's, a fundamental, there's a fundamental challenge with that is that you're, in order to get to that point, you've gone way far down the road into the construction piece in order to just to determine if you can do it properly. Well, the first choice you made if you right. do that is you've got to vacate the town hall. That means you've got to right. go find a rental or a lease to then, then and locate the town hall right. and the rental or the lease, yeah. right. and then you've got to make that choice. Right. I think, I think there was a point um, that, that David had made earlier relative to the you know, drilling through the, the various uh, the floors with the steel, and, you, and maybe you can make that point again, because I thought it was an important, important uh, point well, for consideration. Yeah, I think, you know, with the renovation, and obviously, yes, you can renovate. Nobody's saying that you absolutely can't mm -hmm. renovate. It, no. it can be done. Um, 
But when you when you look at the two buildings, the existing building and uh, building new, you're looking at 15,500 square feet gross square footage versus 13,900 square foot uh, gross square foot. Just on the in the building code uh, energy code alone, you're going to lose 400 square feet of that 13,900 square feet. Then you have uh, some ceiling height issues, which is going to be another loss of square footage. So where we have in the new building, we have a set square footage that, to, that will meet our program needs. In the renovation, we don't know what our, actually, our actual program square footage is going to end up being. We just don't know that. And one of the reasons is when you start adding steel columns, you start cutting the structural uh, concrete deck, you start running ductwork, all that and, and including that, the uh, plan coordination between the MEPs, the mechanical, electrical, and, and plumbing contractors, who always want to be in there first, so they get the, the pick of the, of the runs. Yeah, that's right. When you start running, running those, um, those MEPs in the building, you're going to lose more square footage. Um, you're locked into your, your layouts due to existing window locations and column locations. So you don't have an open, um, uh, open palette to design a building as efficient as possible. Uh, with the renovation, yeah, you can make it work. Mm -hmm. But at what cost and what are you going to have to settle? Not only that, where are we going to be five years from now? Are we going to be out of space again? We're out of space at, at the senior center. You know, there's no room for expansion. Yes, you can build an addition five years from now, but we're going to be going back to the town for more money. So for those reasons, you know, we've decided that, you know, building new would, would probably be the best tack. We know what, what our costs are going to be. We can tell the, the taxpayers, okay, we know our, our soft costs are $557,000. When we go for our, uh, our second ask at town meeting, we're going to have a defined construction number. Right. So, and those are the reasons why I think that was the compelling, some of the more no, compelling no. reasons that we looked at that. Bill? Yes. Uh, I'll give you a little uh, proof mm. on brick. 66 years as a bricklayer. I've looked at that building more than once. I haven't seen a structural crack in that building. When that building was a teenager, 78. There was a little snow. It's still there. It's matured. There's nothing the matter with that brickwork that's visual. Right. That's the, the key word. The key word. <laughs> visual. You're right. Now, You're absolutely right. Why isn't there uh, a crack in that building? Good footing on good ground, good foundation. Good brickwork. Bricklayers from Local 7 from Foxborough put that brick in. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of that. Mm -hmm. I went to a wake last week with a bricklayer in the casket who worked on that building. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell me that there's anything the matter with that brickwork. Because mm -hmm. they can't show me. The brick there was, was in the kiln in the 60s. Mm -hmm. What's going in the kiln today is probably maybe half of the mm -hmm. heat that's going into that brickwork there. I, I don't think that they're, that's the issue. No, it, yeah. no, it's no, really, no, 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 no. No, it's important you hear, you hear this because the only because, reason I'm here is yeah. what was in the paper today. All right. What's important to understand though is is that it's what's behind the brick is the, is the issue. Now the and that's thing that's, was, the that's the concern. Bill, he was so. saying about the brickwork. All it is is five courses and a head of course. Mm -hmm. That's a wall-bearing structure, that mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. I built those buildings, mm -hmm. and they're still up. And the roof is, and the roof is bearing on that wall. You're 100 percent. And the, mm -hmm. there's no, there's no structural cracks in that building. And no one's yet. arguing that. No, as yet. No, but they're saying <laughs> that there's something the matter with it. No, we're, we're saying uh, the design and the, the, the way it was actually uh, built is very different than the way we built any of our other buildings. We don't use, none of our other buildings have our exterior walls as the structural side the way that no, is. No, because this is no, everything now is curtain wall. 
Well, no, I'm talking about. Uh, no, 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 stuff. no. I'm saying most of it, a an apartment, a yeah. apartments are one thing, wall bearing, and we put in the plant, concrete plants, mm -hmm. in a building like that we've got over mm -hmm. there now. That's only an office building, and they, what do they call it? They call it town hall. It's an office building. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. But it's got a patina that I hate to lose. Mm -hmm. And then to try to put a new building on that site at the highest point would be criminal. Well, I'd rather take the building down and use the site the way that the original people did. They used the site. They had enough setback to show it off. Didn't bring it out another 15 to 20 feet. Putting it up on the top and going up another 35 feet. Visualize it. I'd like to have the architects show me a rendering with the computer putting the plantation house up there looking at South Street. Well, that's, well, that's, that's what we're going to have that. We I will mean, have that. We will have that. Yeah, but you better sure. you better start selling it because you might get it all the way through, and then when the people come down to pay the price, they might say no. Mm -hmm. Bill, let, let, me, let me just answer one part of that. I know Jack can <clears throat> jump in on it, too. The problem with the masonry wall is, much as has been described, it's a bonded wall between four inches of cinder block and brick in the front. If you have an eight inch wall, there's something like a five eighths inch gap in the middle, which the masons historically have filled with grout and crap. I, not, not you, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, w when you look at Sandy's office and the treasurer's office where the water has gotten in, it's gotten in at one of those layers of the, the header uh, bond <coughs> issue where water can come down in between the block and the, and the brick, get on this brick course which is flat but goes all the way through, and then seep into the plaster face itself on the inside. The problem we're looking at is, if water is getting into that gap, much as Jack has highlighted, what about this frost and, and uh, thaw period that can occur? Somehow, the damage has not been visible in mm -hmm. terms of right. what the result is. But it can be next year or mm -hmm. the year after or right. God knows how long. And right. th this is the, the real problem. Yep. We don't know anything about that damn masonry wall. Yep. It doesn't meet code, it doesn't meet construction technology right. or anything. There's no, I don't think there's any disagreement over that. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Any other questions, comments? Right. We, this item uh, will be on the town meeting floor for consideration on November 17th. Uh, we encourage all residents to attend. It, it's uh, set for 7.30, I believe. The, the warrant, the meeting is scheduled to start at 7.30, so we hope that everybody will attend and, uh, and ask their questions, or, and uh, hopefully um, they'll have their questions answered. Okay. So I know you came in late. I, I didn't, sort of a late comment to the process, but if, if you have any questions about anything, we're happy to, we'll stick around and, and ask you. Okay. okay. Thank you all very much. Thanks you for joining thank us. thank them for coming. Yes, I do. I want to thank all, all the folks who came here tonight for, for joining us, and, and thanks for being here. Also. And, uh, and, and uh, Jack? Finally, finally, Dick and I can agree on something. There you go. It's been right. a long while. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. It's not in writing yet. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.